Hello, welcome to the 4-7 podcast. I didn't know when that was going to end, and it was long, but here we are. Uh, this is uh, RJ. This is Mike next to me. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Well, wait, wait, wait. Um, it had to be long because it was a, such a great track. I'm so the... I could, I had, to get, I had to be long. His original <laughs> intro video was your entire album. So we just, we cut it down a little bit. Um, Sorry, I didn't hear that guy. <laughs> So we have a very special guest. Uh, we have uh, rock artist Zana with us here today. Um, welcome to the 4-7 Podcast. What's up, everybody? Thanks for having me here today and enduring that super long intro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a great intro. Great, uh, great video. Uh, that was Underneath, uh, which uh, was actually number four on the Billboard Christian Rock Charts. Um, also known for Drown, uh, which came out, and also the album Red for War, uh, which just came out a couple years ago. Um, and so we're here to talk uh, with Zana today about that, about other things, um, just about you. Um, so we brought you on uh, and we're happy that you could uh, come out. Where are you these days? I am in my makeshift home, new home studio in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. And you've been in Texas for quite a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I have a weird story and if, like, I've been told I have a really weird accent too. I was born in Mexico. Okay. I'm like fully a hundred percent Mexican. And then, uh, you know, my, my dad got a job offer here in the state. So he took it and I, it was actually in Ohio, like the most random state. And so I grew up in the North and like thinking like being really confused and being like, I think I'm white. Like I look white <laughs> dad. Like, I don't understand. Like, I don't have no desire to go back to Mexico, you know, but um, I basically came back. Uh, my, my dad, my parents got really tired of the cold up there and it was really hard to see family. So they moved to San Antonio, I think, when I was like going into sixth grade. But instead of me staying with them, I actually like went back to Mexico for like a year. And like I went to school there because my parents were like, you need to remember your heritage. <laughs> and I'm like and I, it was the best thing I ever did, actually. So I went back to uh, Mexico for one school year relearned all my Spanish and understood my roots. And then I came back and we've been in Texas ever since. So that was like 2006 or something is when I've been residing here in San Antonio. Yeah. Nice. And your parents are still in Texas? Yeah, they sure are. Nice. Well, my mom is in South Korea right now for a couple oh. months because my baby lives. Well, my, my sister's having a baby. I not having a baby. My sister is having a baby and she is uh, due tomorrow. So my oh, wow. mom's in Korea with her and her husband to uh, help out. Yeah. Well, so congratulations. My, my oh, thank you. <laughs> so you guys are all over the place. Mexico, Texas, Ohio, Korea. Yeah, uh, Dallas here and there. And uh, my Patrick, my husband is from Houston. So yeah. <laughs> nice. And your husband was the drummer in Random Hero. Um, yeah. And he left the band to join a uh, crazier band, uh, yours. <laughs> So. Yeah. So it's cool because like, you know, a random hero was his thing and, and it was great and everything and just stuff kind of changed and it was awesome. And, you know, he, he kind of is focused on different projects and he just is such an like freaking awesome asset to me. He drums for me. Technically I'm a solo artist, but like he's, he's right there owner with me, obviously. Um, but yeah, he definitely drums for me and um, he's doing some other projects like the guilty party podcast and stuff like that. So yeah. Nice. Uh, now you mentioned, I think, growing up, uh, church was a part of your life. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of church and music? How did that come into your life uh, when you were younger? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, my my history is really interesting. Well, not even my history, my, my parents' history. And um, like, it's hard to, to just glaze over our faith because I tell people like, had it not been for God and his goodness, like literally I would have a completely different life. Like I, I don't even know, like if I would have been born, like I don't, it's nuts. Cause my, you know, my, my parents, they're both first generation Christian. So my dad actually came from a very abusive household with, um, in Mexico. And then my mom came from, um, a, a more rural family that just kind of claimed Catholicism. Cause a lot of Mexican people do, they just don't really know anything about it. Um, and so when my parents became born again, Christians, um, literally like their lives changed in such a drastic, amazing way. Um, so, you know, I've just seen the power of God in like so many ways, like my, my family, I don't even know where they'd be had God not intervened in our lives. I mean, we probably wouldn't even be in the States. Like, I don't know. My father probably would have been in prison had God not changed his life, you know? And so I, I get really passionate when I talk about, you know, 
what Jesus has done for my family, like broken generational curses and provided a way that has brought us to this country to help other people and also our family in Mexico, like everything. So um, my, my parents were, my, were radically saved. Um, and then I grew up in, in that environment, which was amazing, but I didn't really start believing it for myself until I actually went back to Mexico. Uh, like I said, when I was in sixth grade and um, that's when I kind of, you know, when like everything, you know, is kind of ripped from you and like, then you really are left with who you actually are. And in sixth grade, at becoming this teenager, I started understanding like all these existential questions I had, like, what is what is life? Why are we here? And really, when I was over there, um, it was really hard. I was I was without my parents. I, I was living with an aunt who like I, I didn't really know very well. And so um, that was when I actually started to open the Bible for myself because I felt in my heart like if life is just about living and working and just like going to college and like doing random stuff until you die. Like, what is the point of living? Like, I don't want to just live this normal life. And so like, I got really depressed as like an 11 year old because I'm like, I just see nothing, no meaning in this existence, you know? And, and I was really young to understand that. Um, and so when I started reading the Bible for myself, you know, um, the words of Jesus, like just jumped out to me and like, the way he called the apostles and like the disciples, like I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to live a radical life uh, of Christianity and I wanted my life to be for this kingdom of his, you know, and I wanted to be his follower. And I wanted that, that was, that was my calling. Like that was him calling to me. And so I really grasped that very tightly uh, that year. And for like the first time I started having peace and like my loneliness started fading as I would like read the Bible every night. And when I came back to the States, I just really submerged into church and I really started to just tangibly feel the presence of God and worship and really just grow from there. And then I ended up going to uh, Christ for the Nations Institute uh, after high school and I did more years there and studied the Bible and now I just write music about it pretty much. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, my, my faith origin story for you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, yes, you do have an awesome story. And, um, I, I was, I actually came across your music when, uh, you were part of Ilya in, um, 2014, 15 or so. Um, and, um, and then now it's with the Zana uh, solo stuff. It's 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 been awesome watching you transition from that band to this. Um, if you're a fan of one or the other, I feel like you're still going to be a fan of it, just because there obviously are roots in both. Um, but you really let loose with that that latest album that came out, and I thought it was really really good. Um, what were your first interactions in the music scene? Um, you know, as you were younger, uh, who did you listen to, and kind of how did you start to get into the music scene? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, again, I was just really involved in church culture and whatever the Christian kids were listening to in, in youth group, uh, you know, I, I ate up and uh, at the time emo was huge and rock was huge. And you had these tooth and nail bands that was like the bands every Christian kid listened to, you know, um, and I, you know, being in the industry now, I don't really know if they tried to be Christian or if they were just kind of you know, marketed like that. Uh, you know, either way, it didn't matter to me. I was just obsessed with the Christian messages in some of these songs. And um, I would just go to shows. So like, I really, my first show ever was May. And oh, nice. then I would get into like, May was like my break in band. Like they were like rock, but like, like soft rock, you know, like not mm -hmm. compare, like it, it, it was like a spectrum from May all the way to like Devil Wears Prada was like the heaviest, like and everything in between. So like Emery, Under Oath, Silverstein, um, you know, uh, gosh, like, yeah, May, um, Devil Wears Prada. Those are probably like my top five or six bands, you know? Um, and so those really influenced me and, um, just going to shows, becoming part of the culture and in high school, I, <laughs> I had a high school band and we would just do battle of the bands at my high school every year. And like, we took it so serious. We're like, we have to win. And like, nobody really cares about this. But um, my high school band actually was like a really big training ground for me to like, understand what it is to be live to, to perform live how to write songs with other musicians and stuff and so that really like really I was addicted to that I loved my band I really was like at the age of 15 I was like this is what I want to do for the rest of my life um and so that that high school band uh you know I started to feel the call to go to bible school and that was a really confusing time because I was like 
I don't know why I, I felt so strongly that this was supposed to be my calling, but now I feel like God's telling me to drop this and like go to Bible school. And I don't know why. And it, it was like a really hard thing to let go of. And uh, I, I, no one understood why I did that. They were like, Oh, you're being so cool. You know, back then I like thought we were so cool, but like, obviously we weren't. Uh, but you know, it, it was like this weird, like test of faith. Like God, I think you're telling me this. I could be totally wrong. I think this is right but i want to follow you so i like quit my band it basically dissolved without me and then i went to bible school and i shelved music for about three years uh i did a lot of acoustic stuff and like i still wrote songs by myself but like um i don't know like i felt like it was this test that god was like will you let this go if i Mm. ask it of you and uh then i towards the end of the year i had this like weird change of heart i was like you know what i feel like i need to get back into this because i thought like it was going to be done for good Mm. i was like oh i'm called to be like a minister like i think i'm supposed to be a youth pastor or like some kind of evangelist you know and then i had this weird 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 stirring in my heart and i prayed a lot about it because i thought it was like me just trying to be selfish and get this back you know Mm -hmm. and um um, I don't know, like all these things started falling into place. Uh, that Ilya EP that's reborn, I actually recorded that before I joined the band. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that I basically gave that that album to be in the band, basically. Hmm. Um, so when that EP, like, you know, I had a lot of like um, good feedback off that. People were like, what are you going to do with this? Like, this is really good. And then I found out Ilya was actually auditioning for singers. And I was like, I don't I don't think I can do this on my own yet. This is really expensive market to break into you to like start in. What the heck? I'm gonna give it a shot. Let me like reach out to this band, see if I can audition. And I got it, you know, and that was the start of like me professionally touring and being in music as a professional artist. And then that was a whole new level of learning and training and understanding. And then now I'm Donna and I've got the whole thing to myself that I got to run it now. So <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> well, you just solved a huge, um, uh, a huge question for me. Cause, um, I, I loved that Ilya reborn. And then I found our divine romance on mm-hmm. Bandcamp, And I was like, Oh sweet. These must be different versions of the song. And it was the same. And I was yeah. like, Oh, Okay, I, now I I'm literally confused. forgot to delete that page. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. Uh, so yeah, that exists too. So um, yeah. That is, so those songs started out as Art Divine Romance songs that I wrote by, on my own. Mm-hmm. Second, a producer had some friends kind of like help me with it at the time, but none of them like wanted to be in a consistent project with me. They mm-hmm. were like all tied up with like their own stuff, and they were like, you know, yeah, we'll help you record this and write what for you, you know, and help you, but like we won't you know, we can't like commit to being in a band because I was ready to just start a new band, you know? And mm. then I was like, nothing's working. So let me reach out and see what I can do. And then that's when Ilya kind of fell in my lap and, you know, I, I loved it. It was great. So a question for you. So you are an artist, obviously. And I also have in the artist field, I do photography for a living. Um, I, ha- I have my own company and my parents were totally against it growing up. They were like, you are never going to be a photographer because one, you're not good at it. And two, <laughs> you're not good at it. <laughs> and three, you'll never make any money. But like you, I totally felt God 100% calling me to be a photographer. I remember it was like three years of prayer. And all of a sudden yeah. God was like, open door, walk through or stay. What are you going to do? I walk through. Then finally yeah. one day my parents were like, Hey, you're not, you're not, you're actually not that bad. Take our picture. And then I took in, but God just opened those doors. And the biggest thing I've learned is when God calls you to walk through a door, you walk through a door. How did your parents, cause you, how was your family reacting to you saying, Hey, I want to be in a band, not just like a band, a rock band. And I'm going to scream my head off and sing all like, how did your parents like react to this? My parents have known I loved me. I was obsessed with music, like very young. Um, and my dad always really fostered that in me. Like he, when I was in my high school band, he literally like took the time to help me insulate the entire garage so we could have practice. You know, I think for me, it was more so like when I was graduating high school, it was really a big desire for my parents to just do more school. And I don't know, maybe that's why the Lord was like, just do this. I promise it's going to be okay. I just need your parents to be on board here because they're going to really help you in the future. <laughs> 
Um, but like they were so on board. They just wanted me to continue some kind of like education. And when I mentioned CF and I, I mean, that's not even a university. That's just like yeah. a ministry school. Like that was good enough for them. Um, and you know, they have, they, my, my dad has always told me to believe in the impossible. So I really credit him to him because he, he just has always told me like, why do you, why do you live with boundaries? Don't just be wise about your dreams, but go for them. Like make them happen. Um, and he's, he's given me a lot of guidance on, on how to, you know, financially be responsible in a business and all this stuff. So, um, it was never really that much like that they had opposition. They just wanted me to tread very cautiously, especially my mom, cause she just doesn't understand as much about music as my dad did. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, like they've never been, they were never like, you have to be a doctor, you know, or something <laughs> like that. But in Mexican culture, it is, education is super important and for a good reason. I mean, down there, there's less opportunity and you kind of have to go to school um here it's just free market capitalism baby like just do it you know how to sell it you can do it. <laughs> um, so yeah i've had the blessing of having my parents support but um i teach voice students too i'm, I'm, a, I'm a voice teacher actually and uh, and a vocal coach and a lot like 90 percent of my students have had the problem of like a lot of mental barriers because family members have told them like you you're not good stop doing your voice is annoying like stuff like that and so like one of the biggest things we have to work on is like breaking through those thoughts and those problems like literally making them journal out like all their feelings and like express their own hurt because like you can't get over it without those mental blocks or you can't do what you need to do with those mental blocks um so yeah i can definitely see like for me i've, I've been told that too not by my parents but other people um just it's always been silent motivation for me it's like oh okay you guys you want to say i can't do it awesome i'm gonna just keep it in the back of my mind while i do it just so i can laugh at your face later and so um that's always it's always nice to have that little silent motivation to keep you really pushing so <laughs> nice well as i mentioned before i first heard you um when you were in Ilya. i think the the first song i ever heard was young diaries Mm -hmm. um and just that part where you are speaking in i guess the bridge um and you just start screaming towards the end there um you know how can a god love me when i can't even love myself like super powerful i'm like a grown man like 30 something years old tearing up a little bit when hearing that song for the first time um how did Ilya come about in the first place i know they were looking for a singer did you know Ilya at the time um or or was that just a band you listened to yeah, that was a band I, I thought they were just like, you know, I, like think about it, I'm like 16 years old going to youth group. I love screamo music or whatever. And then I hear about this all girl rock band and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. They're all girls and they can rock this hard. And so I kept up with them for several years and um, they lost their first singer um, or they separated. I don't know. Um, and I actually that was like right when I finished high school and I literally wanted to audition. I was like. I think I could do it. I think I could. And then I knew my parents were going to tell me to go to school. And I was like, they're not going to let me do this. I'm like barely 18. I'm pretty, I was pretty immature for an 18 year old, like very immature. I don't think they would have let me go on tour at that time. Um, but yeah. And so I went to school and then by the time I finished, uh, college that's when they lost their second singer or parted ways or whatever and then that's when i was like okay it's now or never like now you can do this now your parents will can't stop you or do anything about it so <laughs> so that's what happened uh, but yeah so that that i had always like seen them and stuff and I, when I had recorded what is now the Ilya EP, I was gonna I was gonna go under Art of Divine Romance, like my stage name. Um, glad I didn't. That is way too common of a name. I don't know why I chose that. Anyway, uh, so like I like was researching all these bands. I'm like, how do these bands do it? How are they successful? So I like went through just a whole day of research and just checking bands social media. What are they up to now? What are they doing? And then I remembered Ilya and that's why I went because I wanted to research. Actually, no, I lied. This is why I went and researched Ilya. I was playing Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Okay, do you see these Zelda posters behind me? It's my <laughs> favorite game ever, Legend of Zelda. And in yeah. Twilight Princess, there is a character named Ilya. And so in this time while I was doing research, I remembered Ilya because I was like, isn't that a band? You know, and so I went and checked and then that's when I saw the uh, the audition post. Um, and I just like sent a video and it was, it was cool. And I met them in person and really connected with them as people and uh, they became my best friends. And so it just, um, it just worked, man. It was good. It was a good nice. place. Now you were there, I think from around 2014 to 2016 ish. 
And then I think it was 17 or so that you made the move to solo artist um, and announced on Facebook that you were uh, going to be doing that. What was your experience like in Ilya? I mean, to my knowledge, I think you guys had the EP that came out. You toured for a little while. There was talk of another album. And then that kind of came to an end. So how was your experience in Ilya? Um, and are you still friends with them now? Is that still a, a good relationship? Yeah, so um, we toured out the EP and, you know, it was cool. Like, it was a good fit. Like I said, a good exchange, uh, you know, since I, I bought the EP or whatever, like the recording and everything, like I had it all done and everything, you know, they 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 pushed it with their their finances. Like, it was a great move. Um, and then we had talked, we started writing more songs and stuff. It was it was interesting because I, I have like a different method of writing. So that was like a little difficult sometimes like to get on the same page. Um, but we actually had all like finished tracking a whole new full length album. And unfortunately, uh, to be honest, just the forces that pushed us this far ended up being our downfall kind of like the manager that we had and this team, quote unquote, really i don't in hindsight like i'm trying to be very careful how i say this um because i have really strong feelings but like i'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here um it just um we were so young man like we were such a young band like we didn't know what we were doing we just wanted to make it big so bad that we just listened to all the wrong people and we made a lot of mistakes and financially and and i i never wanted to be honest with you uh it was not my decision to leave the band uh at all uh i don't want to say fired but i was kind of fired i i don't know they don't like that terminology that they fired me but they literally let go just Let go. me so and, and, you know and and they're gonna have their side of the story and i'm not here to argue about that or whatever um but all i can say is like i would have never ever disbanded that band like not even because the music it was just they were my best friends like hmm. i didn't i i would never do that to them because some manager didn't like them you know i i kind of am out, outspoken i'm a little fiery sometimes i'm told uh and i like to argue um because i don't like making mistakes um so i kind of clashed with management quite a bit there was some unspoken rules about dating that i was already violating apparently that i didn't even know i was supposed to follow because at the time i had met my now husband patrick and i don't know if they thought i was distracted or what like i'm just 23 living my life as a dumb young adult and trying to do this music thing and just loving just being on stage and 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 you know being really naive i think just to like really what was happening in the background so when they let me go um it was completely a shock to me like it really really broke me uh just because i i trusted these people so much um and whether they i don't know what their real motives were i think they were just really led by the management quote unquote that was like telling them you got to be successful the only way you're going to be successful is if you get a new singer blah 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 and i was like Okay, I don't know what to do because y'all like I literally work my tail off. Like I was told I needed to lose weight. So I started working out like crazy, like except I was the only one, apparently, you know, like I had to be the face of the band and I had to do more work, but I didn't even get paid more or anything. You know, I, I'm divulging like way too much. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Like, no, no, it's all good. Wants to hear this. Um, unfortunately, it was a very bad experience. Uh, it was actually very traumatizing, not just for me. I know it was for them, too. I mean, um, to be honest with you, we um, we did not talk uh, at all. Uh, it was a very hostile um, at least on my end, uh, it was very hostile for like two years, uh, just because there, there was just so much pain, uh, behind it. But, um, actually March of this year, I, um, just started growing up a little bit more and, and understanding, like being in the music business now, I understand how stressful it is already. And if you don't have good guidance, like you will fail. And, um, I had to, I had to admit that it wasn't my bandmates that tried to cause all this damage. It, they didn't mean to you, whether they did or didn't, I had to try to understand their motives and give them the benefit of the doubt. And there was things that I definitely did immaturely too, like the way I talked about things. Um, I think it just came from a very deep place of hurt because there was 
really no communication when we uh disbanded um and that that's what hurt me because i was like felt like i was like really left in the dark it was like kind of like when your ex ghosts you and you're just like what i thought we were doing good like why are you, why are you doing this like you know and and so without that explanation it's just you got, you're kind of like forced to put the pieces together and like you agonize over and over and over again like what happened what did i do wrong like i actually wrote a song about it called was i bad on red for war like agonizing like why why would you do this i'm what what did i do so wrong that you did this to me and you know it just it's sad man um but in march i actually reached out to them because you know now being older and like seeing so much more of the music industry and not being so naive um it it, it was just like okay dude just just you need to grow up like reach out to them and apologize for what you did too whatever you know maybe not what you did during the band but like afterwards like maybe that was immature or maybe it's too far and i know you were really hurt but like this is a professional industry like don't be unprofessional you know and 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 i'm honestly honestly guys i miss them a lot i think i think i was so hurt because i loved my band so much and we had so many good memories and like to just just disintegrate it over business was like gut-wrenching um so i honestly missed them and i just want to talk to them so i reached out to them uh, on instagram and 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 we talked and and had a four-hour facetime conversation just wow. literally the first two hours were just catching up we didn't even talk about the band just like hey you know like how is your life like what have you guys been doing the last three years you know and then finally like kind of like the last two hours we just naturally got into like okay what happened to us how did we get this way like what on earth it was just chaos you know at the end of it so it was really good to get some answers in closure uh you know and not be left just so wondering like why why did we lose ourselves like lose our friendships and you know they they got some questions answered too like on my end you know and so um it was it was awesome um and and that that's all i can ask for man like i didn't i didn't i wasn't crushed because the band broke up and i'm like oh no my career my band i'm not gonna be successful. it had nothing to do with the band it was it was because of my our friendship and our my love for them it's like you know you guys are thicker than blood you know like thick like thick as thieves like when you're in a band there's such camaraderie that it's like as a solo artist i do honestly miss like there's no nobody like rooting in your corner as much as your bandmate and when you're a solo artist you're like all right i gotta believe in myself because ain't nobody believing in me more than me you know um <laughs> so that, that 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 is something i do miss about being in a band but um that that was kind of how it went down uh it came to a shock when we went public actually i had to go public i don't know why i was the first one that had to say that Ilya was no more because they you know they kind of chose it so that that it kind of shocked the music community because we had a lot of steam and big people you know rooting for us and everyone was kind of watching us and and we literally had our whole album like tracked and we were just debating so much on when to release it and now looking back I think they were just trying to decide if they wanted to keep me or not which is why they never like started pushing it out which that hurts too like a lot uh like wow okay all right uh I'm dumb I should have seen this coming um you know so you have scars from that but who doesn't have scars in this industry I don't know a single person who isn't like mentally traumatized from the music business so I'm not special man <laughs> I have a question for you. I go, I go, go, RJ. No, it's okay. You go for it. So, I think sometimes Christians are jaded. I think they, I think they feel like, oh, this person's a Christian. My, my wife specifically. Hopefully, she's not listening to this, but she'll be like, oh, I want to hire that person there to walk on the house because it's because they're a Christian. And I think as times as Christians, we expect Christians to act a certain way, Christians to say certain things, Christians never to be rude or jerks or just be conniving. Was going through this process with the band, did it kind of make you feel like, I thought we were a Christian band. I thought we were all on the same team, all, all have the same purpose. What was your mind? Like, did what was your process in this uh, con concerning the whole we're a Christian band, we're going through a whole ton of crap. What's going on? Well, that's the thing, man, is that like we were so ministry oriented until we got involved with this management team that was like 
literally telling me like I needed to perform and make every man in the crowd fall in love with me. Like that was weird to me. Like I, you know, and you're so, so naive. You're just like, okay, well this person who seems to know their stuff is like telling me what to do. Like, I mean, really just, it was a lot of, I'm telling you, man, like this wouldn't have happened had we not gotten in with that manager. Like he, they were telling us like, to do all these things and so my band my bandmates were like trying to listen to these people because they were doing this band like a lot longer than since I came in obviously they're like ready to make career steps you know um and so like I think it was just like man the enemy you know how how Satan is like deceiving and just whispers and starts like putting division and then second thoughts about the people you trusted and then like and then you don't trust anybody and then you're like bitter and then you're like don't even know who you are anymore like that was what our management team did to us like we were thick as thieves this manager promised that if we started doing this stuff we would start to grow we would start to be successful and any like any 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 small like fighting back would be like you don't deserve it then i'm gonna just move on you're you're, you're not worth my time like it was such a toxic gaslighting confusing relationship like it literally was a toxic relationship it's like, almost an abusive almost abusive it was yeah. oh, absolutely i will definitely go as far to say like i have never been so gaslighted in my life or like that's why i still have trauma to this day i'm like i i i i don't deserve any success because because they they say that i'm not good enough and like literally listening to these people that are literally only in it for the money or to mm. take advantage of you and like that theme is completely evident in red for war like especially your gun my knife is actually actually about people like that in the industry who will bully you until you submit to them or spend more money with them or just literally screw up your identity so bad that you know you, you don't even know who you are anymore and you, you feel lower than low. And that's what happened to me a long time after that. I had so much performance anxiety. My first tour is on. I was like, everyone's talking about me. I'm a bad singer. I don't deserve to be up here. I'm not even good. Like just their voices in my head. Like, oh, I'm fat. Like, oh, they're not going to receive this well because I don't look a certain way. Like your mind is just so mush, you know, and, and you don't know who to trust. Like, you want to do music and you want to continue, but everything about this industry is so toxic. Or why Why have I encountered so many toxic people? I'm like a magnet for toxic people. Like, is it me? Am I toxic? Like, I'm just trying to figure this out. Um, but yeah, so it, it's not that, that like as Christians, like they did a certain thing. I don't think it was that. I just think like people people really think like being in a band is just a straight church ministry. It's not, you cannot operate a band the way a church ministry operates. I'm sorry. It's, it is a business. You have to understand this. However, your art, that is where I put my faith in because the mm -hmm. songs I write are show my art. Other than that, it's business because I can't survive without income. I won't be able to put out the quality of music that I can if I don't charge like a business okay so my that's how i view a band is or my project this is a business however when i step on stage and i have your attention that is my moment to be pouring out my faith and my testimony and um other than that i have to operate as a business so i don't i don't think it was a christian thing i don't think that i think i think we were just so naive that we listened to literally the worst people and just bankrupted into just chaos, you know? Um, and that happens with businesses. You bankrupt, you make mistakes and small, small mistakes can be really, really detrimental. And if you don't know better. And if you're listening to the wrong advisors, you will fail. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. I don't know how they see it. Um, but unfortunately, fortunately I was able to bounce back at use all that that I learned and finally had good mentors and good people that I listened to that were actually had my best interests at heart. And that's very hard to find because um, everyone in this business is usually just out for themselves. And that's, that's the truth. It's, it's, it's hard. That's, I mean, it's really, I'm really happy that you're, you're being transparent with us because these are things that I think people go through, not only in the music business, but in the church, in their jobs, in their homes, sometimes in their relationships um, with this kind of abuse, you know, it, it, uh, of, of being gaslit or um, being made to feel like you're not enough or you're not good enough. And, and clearly I think it happens to people who are good enough. And I don't mean it 
that, that sounds weird, but I think it happens more to people who are on the right track is what I mean to say. Uh, you know, Ilya, for me, when I first heard you guys, like you said, I think I was one of those people that was just, okay, when's the next thing coming? Because they're going to be big. Like, that's yeah. that's where it is. And so obviously this was years of growth for you. It was years of learning for you outside of the pain and the, the destruction it caused. It also, it, it stretched you. It caused you to learn and grow and mature. What made you move forward as a solo artist? Did you take some time to just kind of rest and, and get better from that pain and then make that decision? Or was it like immediate, I'm going into it? Man, it's so immature. Like, I just wanted revenge. Like, I just wanted to be like, no, stick it to everybody. Like, you abandoned me. Very cool. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick butt. And uh, I have so much to say that I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. Like, hmm. uh, cause we disbanded at like early, like, I think it was even November, 2016. It was like literally Thanksgiving weekend. It was like the worst holiday season of my life. It just, it was awful. Um, and then I think by January, 2017, I was like, I'm just gonna go solo. Cause I just have so many things I'm writing because I'm like analyzing the situation. I was, I was really depressed. I would just stay home. I, 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 I would just write and write and write lyrics because that's how I heal. I have to write songs to heal. Right. Um, and it, it's my therapy. So it's like, it's not that I tried to like throw anybody under the bus. It's that I had to heal myself. This is the only way I knew how I was going to release music. Uh, people were interested in working with me. And you know what? I was like, I don't see why I can't do this. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but I... I just need to release these feelings because I'm so scarred. I need to heal. So it was literally about a month or two months that I was already like with my name, ready to go. I had already like kind of thought about names because Ilya and I, we had like some different writing styles and there was some songs I was working on that I was like, man, this is a really good song, but they don't like it. And I really want to like release it. So I had already started thinking about having a solo side project while being an Ilya. And then Ilya disbanded. And I was like, okay, just going to roll with my solo idea plan anyway. And then why can't I be a full rock artist and have complete creative control on anything I release? It just seemed so appealing, you know, because the only reason I'm a musician is because I'm so passionate about songwriting. Like that is why I do music is because I really take the craft of songwriting very seriously and you know i just love being lyricists and doing that so uh, yeah about two months um i had already had my name ready to go and i uh, um had good credit and i took out a loan and i started man just startup costs and i just did the whole thing and i think unfortunately like we talked about before like it's the silent motivation the fire inside of you to prove people wrong that made me fearless like i don't know if it was a good fearless or not but i was like here we go, because I've, I've I've got to I've got to release this in my soul. Um, and at the time, I was also dealing with like understanding I had this like disease that was going to shut down my kidneys one day. Um, so all this turmoil was happening in my life. I was literally like in and out of hospitals because like my blood work was really weird. And they were like, "Either we you have a disease and we don't know what it is." So like I had to like do this biopsy like on my kidneys. It took them like six months. I had to go to like genetic testing. And in the six months, they were like, you are on your way to kidney failure. And we don't know why. And wow. so then I came back with that. I have a genetic disease that um, only I have in my family. I guess I started the genetic mutation in, in me. Um, and that was like happening all at the same time. I was trying to like lift this solo project off the ground. So you can imagine how much turmoil was in me after having this like chaotic band breakup. I was really poor at the time. I had like no money. Um, and I, here I am like having some disease, like what, you know, too many yeah. weird things. And so that all of that influence, all that turmoil was put in a red for war. And I honestly, didn't even know it was going to do what it did. Uh, I didn't plan for it. If I had, I would have spent a lot more money on song quality and recording. Um, but I didn't know it was going to get picked up. <laughs> and uh, next one's going to be way different because I, I learned a lot with the release of Red for War. So I'm really excited for the next record. Nice. Well, yeah. So in this season, you just mentioned your your health issues. You mentioned, um, you know, uh, leaving the other band, starting this solo career. You signed with Rockfest Records uh, at some point. Um, how does that feel being surrounded by probably some of the best bands in in Christian rock with Seventh Day Slumber, Letter Black, Fireflight, uh, probably people you were listening to, um, you know, growing up. How does it feel being surrounded by those influences now? And you mentioned it earlier 
how does it feel surrounding yourself with more positive people that are encouraging you? Um, it's still hard, man. Like, honestly, like, I hate to say it, like, had I still been in Ilya, I would have been really naive and like stoked out of my mind. Unfortunately, when you just go through like, the motion of like, yes, I'm just naive. I'm just so like, stargazed of everything. Like, and then you go through what I went through. It's like really hard to like believe in stuff anymore. Like, yeah, you're like, oh, cool. I'm on the same thing as Firefly. That's awesome. But it's not like, oh my gosh, like this is amazing. <laughs> I wish I could be like that. I, I don't know why. Like, I've just been through so much and it's like, it's really hard, you know? Um, it definitely like, I'm glad that, that, you know, the cost I had to pay is is finally paying off and doing something. And God is so good. And he's turned so much of my pain into a testimony and I'm so grateful and happy for that man I just you know I, I I of course I'm honored to be with those artists they're incredible artists they they are legends man they are you know um I'm just excited to move forward I I think for me I take I take my artwork my my my, my songs really seriously and all I want to do is produce more content that's better and better um so I'm just kind of focused on me I'm like you make yourself the best. Don't worry about anybody else. Be who you are and support when you can and just keep going. So it, it's awesome, though. You, you, you know, I think it's kind of a cult. Th- and I remember you're saying, you know, you wish you were that starstruck. But I think from what you came from to where you are now, I think it's a really good position to be in. Because when sometimes, like, if I see the person I always want, like, if I saw Kevin Young or John Cooper walk in and I'm like, oh, my God, God. I sounded like, I just sounded like a rock star. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like, uh, um, I think like, you know, at times when we're so starstruck, our guard is down exactly. and we, and exactly. we kind of like, we don't, we may not see what God wants us to see. We're seeing what we want to see where when we're like, you know, something, my guard's going to be up here because I want to protect my heart. You know, there's a song. Okay, this is gonna really date myself here, but I'm like, <laughs> but there's an artist named Steve Green from like the early '80s to '90s Christian music, and the song's horrible. But it's the the, the I guess the, he's the, not the, coming on the podcast. <laughs> 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 but the song, the lyric goes, "Guard your heart, don't trade it for treasure, don't give it away." And I think a lot of times is that when people are our, our guard is down, we're like. Okay, do whatever you want because I'm so ecstatic right now. Yeah, it, it you know, and, and you you see what you want to see. And now, now my 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 position has kind of changed. Like when I really respect a musician is because they're actually like really freaking talented. Like there's something about their stylistic approach to music that I'm like amazed by, or like you know their vocal technique like blows me away. You know, it, it's just really hard now for me to be starstruck because I'm. I'm in the industry. I know the tips and tricks that singers use in the in the studio. I know how you can doctor vocals. I know about so many things in the industry that are just perception. You know, they're not reality. And that's okay. I mean, that's a tactic to market bands and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of like I have worked with people that I was starstruck and they ended up hurting me really bad. And so unfortunately, like, I hate to be that way. I wish I could be the sweet naive loving bubbly person you know that my husband met when you know we first met each other I'm unfortunately not that anymore um and and that's hard it it is but I don't think I can go back because it is a realistic defense that I have um again though credit where it's due like a lot of these people are incredible at their craft like they're very talented skilled musicians so i try to kind of like more so respect not idolize but respect people that Mm -hmm. i really enjoy their the way they are crafting themselves as musicians that's what i respect more so than the lights and outfits Mm -hmm. and glam of being in a band like that doesn't even matter to me anymore I think that's that's a good way to look at it. Respect mm. over idolizing. I mean, Mike and I, when we started this podcast, you know, a, a part of us is like, oh gosh, these people are saying yes to us. We're gonna get to talk to these people. And then, like the other half, like is like, you know, they're just people at the end of yeah, the day. Like, really and they're some of them are awesome people. People I've looked up to. But our first episode was was Matt Baird from Spoken, and mm-hmm. that was like my you know get. Um, and then, and then we got two guys from Disciple, um, uh, Josiah, who I think you actually worked a little bit with this past uh, year. Yeah. Um, and 
<laughs> he's the man. And, 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 and it's just, it's one of those things I think as, especially as Christians, I think we got to stop with the idolizing and do a little bit more of just the respect, respect what they're doing, respect how they do it. Um, but, but the idolizing thing only hurts you in the end. I yeah. mean, dude, I can't agree enough. Like me and my husband were just talking about this. Like, you know, we get people like who come to our shows and are like, what's your favorite Bible verse? But like in a condescending <laughs> weird way that is like, they're trying to make sure we actually read our Bible. And it's like, why are you here? Like, are you here to like find some kind of fault in our personal lives? Because one, you shouldn't be idolizing me. I'm not your pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm not your youth pastor. I'm not your worship leader. I am a creative artist and I'm a commercial artist. Like I'm not even like a CCM artist, dude. Like do not look <laughs> to me for spiritual guidance. However, yes, I try to live my life according to God's word, but is that your job to come and tell me what I'm doing? Like, why are you idolizing these people anyway? Mm, you know, I amen. just never, I just never understood. Like these bands that I listen to, I just love their music, whether they smoked a cigarette backstage or cussed, you know, like I heard the message in the song. Okay. That's what drew me closer to my God. Their person, they're just a person dealing with their own stuff in their own life. I'm not their pastor. I'm not here to correct them. I'm not their teacher. Okay. I am connected to their music. And, you know, that's why I encourage Christians, like, stop idolizing the person. Connect with their music. And does it make you get closer to God? Does it feed your soul? Does it nourish you? Does it does it help you to keep going? You know, does it make you happy even, you know? Um, so that's what I think Christians need to understand. It's, 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 it's the song and the music. I'm just a person like you. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate everything you just said. And what you said has struck with me because when we started this podcast you know we, we I, I remember i was driving somewhere i'm like rj we need to do a podcast on christian music i love christian music i love the history of it i love talking about the history of the bands where they came from but i also love talking about faith to me faith is like the gasoline that gets me through the day it's an amazing thing and i think it was going on in our country and it's slowly or to be honest even rapidly affecting the american church we're we're becoming idolizers of people. We want Absolutely. that we want that rock star preacher. I'm not gonna say names, but we know a few that's have happened in the past, but we're not gonna say names. <laughs> Keep yeah. it at that. Yeah. It wouldn't do it wouldn't do any justice. But my point is we look at these people, okay, they wear skinny jeans, they you know, do all these things, and they they look trendy. They they're who they're who I want to be, but I can't be. So I'm gonna try to live my life through the people who I'm idolizing. And all of a sudden, you know, instead of worshiping Christ, they're worshiping somebody else. They 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 take Christ off the altar. They put and they put somebody else on that altar, and then they expect that person to be perfect, and they're not. And then when they're let down. I've seen people walk away from the faith and I'm like, why would you yeah. what all you're doing is setting yourself up for failure. You exactly. need to 100 percent oops sorry 100 percent focus on Christ and him and once you take your eyes off him, you're, you're gonna it's like being in quicksand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Christ has that stick waiting to pull you out, but as soon as you let go and take your hand off that stick, you're gonna sink. Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right, man. Like it's it's the teaching. Like you know, even there's I, I went to Bible school. I've heard a lot of preachers, guest preachers, stuff that I'm like, what? That doesn't even sound right. Uh, this guy sound a little off. Like I don't know where his theology's at. But you know, you 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 eat the meat and spit out the bones, man. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's mm -hmm. natural human tendency to want to envision a face to these teachings, and follow them. You know, like that's why everybody from each different race envisions Jesus as the same race as them, you know, naturally, because that's what they relate to, you know? So like, it's going to happen. Like I, if it, ha I, I don't blame people for doing it. However, a lot of people are in places where they're very young in their faith and they totally believe like that that's okay to idolize people, whether they know it or not, because they are babies. Like the word describes them as babies. They mm -hmm. need milk. Like they need something or someone to follow. They need, someone that they can mirror and learn from um but at the same time i don't know where we got these like musicians or my new pastors like i don't know where that came from dude i don't know who started doing that because musicians are some of the craziest people i've ever met 
So why are you expecting these people to be your spiritual leaders? They don't even know your name, bro. Like, I'm sorry to tell you this. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I think it's so important. Like, I wanted to be a youth pastor growing up, and I wanted to maybe go to be a pastor. And to be honest with you, I, for, for my profession, I never wanted to be a photographer. And it really, what I'm trying to say is, during these times as we're growing, even in even where we're always should we always should be growing, but we we have to so focus and stay laser focused on what Christ wants us to do, because I believe everything that we say, everything we do, is either for or against Christ. And I don't know. It just it it, it amazes me when I see the, the church, the American church, just idolize people instead of idolizing Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And I think honestly, that's part of like, they haven't actually felt the tangible presence of God yet. Like, absolutely. Amen to that. That's the thing. Like, I, 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 I sound like I don't want to sound conceited, but like, I literally felt God speak to me. Like, I don't say that lightly. Like, I say that he's called or tugged on my heart. But one time, one, one, one time out of like all these years of being Christian, he literally did speak to me and it changed my life like mm-hmm. forever. Like, yeah, it's like the word describes like Jesus touched them and they were forever changed, you know, like mm-hmm. they were forever healed. They were brand new, you know, like that's how I felt. So like I've been to so many revivals where like the presence of God was like healing blind people, you know, and people be looking at the evangelist on the mic rather than literally seeing the presence of God around you. Like, that's what you need to touch. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to reach for. Um, And, you know, man, like I've seen it all. Like I've seen a lot. I went to Bible school for three years where we had guest speakers and, oh, the hype around this one speaker we're going to get. And it's like, you shouldn't be looking at that. Um, But yeah, you're totally right, man. Um, I, I try in every way that, you know, it's funny because we say like, yeah, Jesus went against the Pharisees. And then we say that. And then sometimes we, we literally are the Pharisees. Like, as we say that. Amen to that. Like you realize Jesus. Sorry, I got excited for a second. (laughs) You realize Jesus literally broke the Sabbath. Like that was a big deal. Okay. Yes. And then, you know, people get upset. Like he used some, some harsh words too. Like he went off on people. And then, like, me as a Christian, like, oh, I don't like the way she wears so much black, you know, when and when they look at me. And I'm just like, girl, like, <laughs> you are focused on the wrong thing. Like, focus on truth. Focus on the way Jesus was. Like, don't paint him out to be like, like, when people think Jesus was gentle, I'm like, you haven't read the word. And I can just tell right now, you know. Um, but again, people are young in their faith. And it's okay. I used to be like that, too, guys. Like, when I was young in my faith, I did idolize band members. You know, I heard... I went and saw Under Oath, which is like very spiritual messages in their song, like back in the day. Not yeah. so much anymore, but like they cussed on stage and I was like, oh, how could they? You know, man, that's <laughs> that's not cool, but I still love them. But I don't know why they did that, you know. And so I, I was there, too, because I was young in my faith. So, like, I have to try to understand when people do that to you. Like, there are literally people who in, like message me on Instagram and they're like, do you believe and the revelation coming of Christ and the dragon and, and Christ and his body and his bride. And like this stuff that literally sounds like you're crazy talk. I don't even know who you are. And you are trying to trap me in a conversation to expose something about me. Like it happens, man. Like people literally, they see that underneath music video that you guys played in the beginning. And they're like, why are you wearing a demon mask in your music video? I'm like, I don't even have time to talk to you today, dog. Like, just be gone out of my DMs. Like, I wear a mask to show a very, like, obvious metaphor of, like, the darkness in me that is trying to come out, you know? And and people literally try to message me and trap me into conversations with screenshots. So it's like, you you just can't give those people attention. They're kind of crazy. Like, the Lord loves them. They're part of the body. They're just probably young in their faith, and it's okay. Like, they'll hopefully grow out of this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, I, the last, and I'm really happy because getting to know you a little bit more in this podcast, the last three years for you have been, uh, maybe not without pain or discomfort, but they've been uphill for you. You got married in the last couple of years. Um, you have a new album over the last couple of years. You're working on a new album. You're doing consulting work. I think you mentioned a little bit ago as well. Um, so, and, and not to mention something else, I just got into the Grizzly Awards, which happened 
uh, once a year. You've been nominated three times, which yeah, is really cool. Yeah, one song. That that surprised me a lot. I That was awesome of them. That yeah, that song came out of nowhere for me. Um, so I have two daughters um, who are eight and nine. They love Taylor Swift. Um, oh. And uh, so I do too, whatever. Um, and <laughs> so I listened to it. And then I heard your version. And I'm just like, first off, I love screamo music from back in the day. Metal. You know, I listen to Under Oath, Emery. So to hear... Uh, a screamo version of a Taylor Swift song. Uh, first off, I got to be honest, my kids were horrified. Um, <laughs> but now they love it. Actually, right now, my daughter is sleeping in her room listening to your cover <laughs> at full blast currently. Yeah, um, girl. <laughs> so I don't know how she's sleeping, but she is currently with that playing in the background. Um, what made you want to do that song? Did you, I, I can't remember. I was looking back to see how you came up with that. Was that just a, uh, from from one of the fans or was it just, do you like Taylor Swift? How'd that come about? Yeah, so um, back when the pandemic hit, like I got a lot of commission work, like a lot of people hitting me up for features or collabs and stuff, which is hmm. great. Like that was really exciting for me. Um, this guy named Steve Osboon, he literally just DM'd me on Instagram and was like, hey, like I have this cover song project. I try to feature like artists every now and then. And he actually sent me a different Taylor Swift song or some some other song, I don't remember. And it wasn't like dark enough for me. Like it, it wasn't red? heavy. I think you were. T uh, I don't remember. I kept it was seeing like, like there was all these people telling you what you should do. I think you had asked uh, a while had, back for what asked, cover song. Yeah, yeah. And then I don't, I don't remember how it fully happened. I just know Steve came to me with some song he wanted me to feature on, and um, I was like, you know, do you have anything else? Because I'm not really feeling this one. I don't think it really matches my voice. Um, can I? And and then he showed me Taylor Swift, which I mean, the, there's been covers of it before. Like it's been done. However, um, I had always envisioned, I and mean, this song is just great to do a metal cover. Like the way it's structured, the way the instrumentals are, are perfect for a rock album, you know, or a rock version, excuse me. And so he had already had these dope instrumentals written. And at the time I am still working on my, my salt, like my new record. I can't really release anything until like, I totally know what's going to happen. Um, and so he, I was like this, I really like this track, Steve. Like I won't even charge you my rate because I'm really invested in this. I really like this. So I think I can do a lot with this. Um, so it was my idea, but it wasn't at the same time. It just literally fell in my lap. And so Steve is an, actually an awesome person. Like he has actually become one of me and my husband's like close friends now. Um, this random guy, like I didn't even know at the beginning of the year is like a close friend now. And uh, we had gone up to Nashville to do some of my song tracking. So I, at the same time I was there and started working on this cover. And it was basically the purpose I released it was to kind of give my fans something um, to, to, to jam while I kind of figure out this new album and its release because uh, we're trying to make it really, really big. So um, I kind of just threw it out there as like, uh, here, here's an appetizer. Y'all kind of just take this and this is just a little taste of what's to come. And uh, yeah, so it worked out, man. It got really good response. I'm like, honestly, really shocked. Like, it wasn't like a super planned thing. It was just like, hey, this works. This is convenient. Let's just throw this out. And the video even was actually really affordable too. Like the way it all panned out was like perfect. And then I literally was like, hey, I'll just release it New Year's Eve because everybody's up. And it's kind of like gives them a little extra incentive. And also I was trying to get in for the Grizzly Awards. I was like, it had to be released in 2020. So I was like 15 minutes before 2021, <laughs> done, let's do it. So we released it at like, I don't know, like 1145 Eastern time. And uh, then it got three nominations, which I was like really confused about. Um, I, I mean, it's awesome. I was just like, wow, that's cool. One song did that. So yeah. <laughs> I actually met Taylor Swift's dad once. It was, I, I was being kind of creepy, so I was do. So I used to be a wedding photographer for years. I actually photographed RJ's wedding a couple years ago, yeah. and uh, I'm walking. So she lives in Rhode Island. So we, we're from Rhode Island. She has this big seventeen million dollar mansion in Rhode Island. Now to get to the beach, you have to walk on the side of her house. It's like a path, but it's really? all fenced off. So I see this guy out there, and I'm like, "Well, here's my chance." I go, "Oh, buddy." Is Taylor home? <laughs> he, he, he goes, who's asking? Um, me. <laughs> he goes, me? he goes, that's my daughter. I'm like, oh crap. I've been, I've been, I've been in this position before. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that's like Taylor Swift's dad. That's like the most famous person, like 
that's more famous than anybody I've ever so, met. So good on you. <laughs> so I go, you know, I'm saying to myself, this guy's full of crap. He's that like Taylor Swift's dad. He gave me these guitar picks with Taylor's face on it. This is before Red came out. He's like, he's like, buddy, Red. Then you have a new CD. He has a new CD coming out. It's gonna be amazing. I'm like, you're not Taylor Swift's dad. <laughs> <laughs> then, I, then, I, then I, then I go and this. I'm like, let me just Google this guy. I'm like, oh, holy crap, that's Taylor Swift's dad. Hey, buddy. How you doing? <laughs> that is, again, I reiterate, that is more famous than any famous person I've ever met. So good on you. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. I that told my funny. wife, I came home, I'm like, April, I was talking to my wife, do not touch me tonight. You can't touch my hands, nothing. I got, <laughs> I got swift germs on me. No one can touch me for a week. I mean, well, she's great. I I love Taylor Swift. Just to reiterate, like I respect her. I definitely. I, people like hate on her, and I don't know why. I'm like, dude, she's really talented. I don't know what she's wrong super with talented. Her. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like her when I was younger. I and I went to Disney, and I guess she was playing around Disney, and uh -huh. I was getting on the Toy Story ride, and a girl gets out of the ride. I sit in the ride, and everybody goes nuts, and I realized it was Taylor Swift. <gasps> So I got to sit where Taylor Swift sat. That's about as, as big as it gets for me. But I looked and I was like, that looks like Taylor Swift. And then everybody started screaming. And I was like, I guess it is. And then I had to become a fan after that because I kind of met her. So uh, yeah. I started listening to her stuff. So How did y'all get these awesome interactions? What the heck, man? That's so unfair. <laughs> I would say Tay Tay is my Fei Fei. So. She is well, baby. She's, yeah. she's a Rhode Islander now, so we have to, you know, we have to to defend her now because yes, she is a Rhode must. Islander at, at at heart. But um, well, we're hitting the hour marker, so we don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, one of the questions we kind of always get into with everybody is, um, you know, relationships. You're you're, you're married. Uh, it's been a couple years now. How has that changed? Um, your kind of everyday life, that your career, your music outlook. Um. You know how do you how do you guys manage your career or, or I'm sorry your marriage on the road um, and, while you're doing all of this? Yeah, so I'm I'm telling you, man, like you guys are married. Like this has been the craziest adventure I've ever been on. Like marriage is the hardest thing I've ever done, yet the most special, incredible thing I've ever done. And I, I'm so excited for this new record. Like, it is so emotional to me just because it is, there's just so much of my story in there. Mm. Um, it, just mostly of this last two years, like everything I went through. I had a kidney transplant in 2019, which talk about stress on a new marriage, you know. Um, and while I had that, he was um, touring to promote his new album with Random Hero. So it, it was a very stressful, uncertain time um a lot to put on a brand new married couple you know um and so like i i just say like my husband is my muse i have learned so much about who i am being his wife and like it's the most special thing um so again there was a lot of learning curves a lot of difficulty in the beginning like hey we're two separate touring entities like how do we learn how to tour with each other like how do we learn who each other even is like how do we learn how to live together how do we learn how to manage this really stressful career that is like money guzzling and try to put a health crisis on top of it like mm. i i don't know how like i just know that like we truly love each other because we are still together <laughs> did, well here's, here's a big question how did you guys actually meet yeah so we met um it's funny in 2015 i played this um uh with Ilya. i was in Ilya. we played this indian reservation festival it was like a ministry thing oh nice and um random hero his band uh played like right after us or something or they headlined or something and so i saw patrick from a distance he was drumming and like he was really attractive to me and i was like dang that guy's really cute but i don't approach guys i just don't do that i never have um but his whole band was wearing wedding rings so i just assumed he was married um so that was it um a whole year later basically uh Ilya had a touring opportunity and then they told me it was going to be with random hero and i was like that's the guy that's like the super cute drummer. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose my mind. And at the time I was single too. And I was like, don't be weird, just be cool. Um, and I found out he was like kind of singlish too. I mean, he was talking to people like when you're when you're single, you're talking to girls or guys, you know. It single happened. and ready to mingle. Yeah, just mingling, you know. And so we had like instant fireworks, and he had already been on my radar for like a whole year. <laughs> so like, and he didn't even he didn't see me that day though. Like I saw him. 
but he didn't see me. <laughs> um, and later I was like, you didn't even notice me at that festival. And he's like, I was having such a bad day. I'm so sorry. If I would have just looked up, I could have seen you and met you a whole year earlier. And I'm like, it's okay. Things are meant to be the, the way they are. Like, you know, just joking around. Well, um, I'm glad that worked out for you. Cause I feel like if I had met someone and was like, you know, I've been thinking about you for a year. I saw you a year ago. They'd be like, oh, yeah, see ya. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't tell him that until like I knew he liked me already. See, like you we guys have a great, you guys have a great story. That's an, see, that's a, like my wife and I, we, we met like online. So there was, there was no sparks. It's like, you want Christian mingle? What were you on? <laughs> yeah, right. Christian mingle and ready to mingle. Let me just tell you right there. No, <laughs> no, it was, um, eHarmony. I was, no. I was love at first click. That's, that's about as romantic as we get. No. But like, so we actually make up stories. How'd you meet? Oh, I met her at a bar. She was fantastic. Oh. No, you know, <laughs> but yeah, you, you guys actually have a good story. That's like a story you can tell your kid. That's a great story. Yeah. We always tell each other, like either the, like we, we were a godsend to each other or literally the devil brought us together because <laughs> as soon as we started dating everything changed like yeah. my band started like being weird to me and like i don't know like my whole life literally drastically changed as soon as like i started dating him um and then i, I now i know it was just god putting pieces together that were already mm. meant to be you know um at, at the time i was like i'll never leave Ilya. Ilya is my life and then they made that decision for me so i was like oh okay well at least i have this amazing supportive guy that i met through it and i think i love him and i think he might we might get married you know and so like God, God has a plan. Like the, he mm. takes you through phases and steps and he knows the plans he has for you. So I don't regret Ilya at all. You know, I have some amazing, incredible lifelong memories from it. I met my husband through Ilya. Like I didn't even mm. stop music after it disbanded. So like, you know, um, another awesome thing about marriage is like now being a solo artist, like I really don't answer to anybody, but my husband and my husband has been there to bounce ideas and literally tell me the truth every time. And, it, you know, when you're in a band, you're, like, married to all the band members. It's so much easier when it's just one person and you guys, like, make decisions <laughs> together. Um, and so, like, he is that rock that, like, I know will always have my back. Like, he even said that in his vows. He was just like, I will take every negative comment, word, or gesture that comes your way. I will protect you. I will, you know, and, and, and I never really felt that, that, like gassing me up before you know i was like wow this man makes me feel powerful like he makes me feel heard and he always tells me you're, you're just so talented why are you wasting your time with these people that are irrelevant insignificant like you are awesome like don't let anybody and and i didn't really have that mentality before again i was really naive i was very kind of like just trying to make everybody happy and um you know, through the, the disbandment of my band, I, that's, that's when like everyone was telling me, Oh, it's your fault, Susie. Like you did this, you did this to yourself. And he was like, no, you didn't. You, you, they messed up. Like you were in the right. And, and, and having that person that like, it always really just loves you and has your best interest. And like, we'll tell you the truth has changed me as a woman. Like I do not operate the same way anymore. I, he has shown me to have self-respect to like, be confident and not not arrogant but confident and people people think confidence is arrogance for some reason when you actually have true confidence you have a different demeanor you talk mm -hmm. differently you approach people differently you negotiate differently and i feel like when i got with him i learned how to have guts like that and mm -hmm. to be confident not arrogant but confident and so i i i always tell him like you made me a warrior you know because you are a warrior so it, it's beautiful it's chaotic when you have two really intense people and they get married it becomes really intense and they like to fight a lot but they love each other so much so it's a very fierce relationship that's very passionate two warriors two headstrong people coming together to be a power couple man it's 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 pretty incredible to be part of <laughs> before we before we wrap up i want to say i really admire how you're describing your marriage because when i'm at church and i see some single young guys there and we start talking about marriage and then i always say like when you find that one person that god has for you you know it's one of the best i love being married so i tell these guys i'm like when you find that one person that god has set aside for you and you live that marriage with christ at the center 
it does amazing things. Like it's not going to be easy. Like marriage is tough. Very like hard. there's yeah. things like there's times like you say things you're like, Oh, I should not have said that. And they're <laughs> like, Oh, that was not a good thing to say, but it's during those times. It's like James chapter one It's through those trials. It's testing of your faith. It really brings you up, really binds you together. Mm-hmm. And I, I just totally resonates with me because that's how I view my marriage. My wife has yes. totally brought me up and, and I, I'm just going to say that I'm stupid for saying this because you heard it so many times, but Hey, if my wife was an animal, she'd be a fox. <laughs> Uh, he he literally has this is the 10th time i think this is the 10th episode oh, you have said that, that um was set up wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for being on the show um we really appreciate you taking your time out and 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 talking with us about everything um and if you don't mind after we go off live we'll just uh say goodbye and uh, wrap things up but uh, thank you guys. Uh, before we let you go, is there anything that you want to um, let people know about? Any places they can go? Uh, any links or anything like that, that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, guys, go ahead and follow me on social media. If you want to see what I'm up to, um, check out my website, ZanaOfficial.com, or you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at ZanaOfficial, Z-A-H-N-A, Official. Um, and yeah, just keep posted on all my new stuff. I got a new Taylor Swift cover out on YouTube if you want to check out. Um, and stay safe from the Rona. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us again for another live episode of the 47 Podcast. This is Mike. I'm RJ. You guys have a good day night, whatever it is. I don't care.